Hello everyone, welcome back to Marketing Analytics. In this video, we will discuss a ubiquitous output in today's world, data. Believe it or not, data used to be hard to come by because the resources and money needed for tracking data used to be prohibitive for small businesses. It is, however, very different now. Even you can write an app to track users. In today's world, there's a lot of data for you to explore. Let's get to it. So, let's talk about data. First, let's start with a few examples. Is this data? This is for the movie The Wolf of Wall Street. And here's a review on Amazon. It says, be aware, not a nature documentary. I figured with the title, it was a documentary about how urbanization is affecting wildlife, but no, it's about some scumbag that does a bunch of drugs and has a boat. So this is the top voted uh, review for The Wolf of Wall Street. The star ratings, one out of five stars, is obviously data, a rating of one versus a rating of five, so we can easily process it. So my question for you is, is the review itself, is the content, the text of the review data? Hold on to your thoughts. Now let me give you a few more examples. We are all fairly familiar with the Google search landing page. Let's say I go to google.com and I type in introduction to marketing analytics. And on the left hand side, this is what I see after I've typed in the keyword. On the top, you see that some of the search results are marked as at. You see all the top four results are marked as ad, which means these are paid search results. And then below that, we start to see what is commonly called in the industry as organic search results. So these search results without ad this will be the top hit of your keyword search uh, without paying for it. For a landing page like this, obviously Google would have done a ton of research on how to lay out this page, how to place the ad, and what kind of ads to play to maximize the revenue that Google can receive from these advertisers. Here's some fascinating demonstration from tracking people's eye movements. That is, when someone look at this page frantically, where are the focal points of the eye movements? This shows you the focal points of eye tracking. The hotter area, the red and yellow area, indicates a higher density of focal points for the eyes. So when you look at this page, your eyes stay in those areas more frequently. The cooler colors, such as blue, light blue, uh, they represent the areas where the eyes are not spending much time looking at them. So as you can see here on this page, there is a golden triangle on the top left of the Google search landing page where people tend to look at them the most often. And perhaps not surprisingly, that's where Google puts the advertising. And one thing you notice on the right hand side is Google used to have sponsor links advertising on the right hand side banner. This area does not get a lot of attention from Google users. Google has got rid of advertising on the right banner. And nowadays when you go to Google, pretty much all the advertising would be focused in this area and Google may have more advertising at the bottom of the landing page. So the next example is Tinder the dominating dating app on mobile devices. Let's say you are on campus. This is where you are. And you were sitting on campus for half an hour. You look at some profiles and you swipe to left, you swipe to the right. So you played around on Tinder for a while. Tinder uses your location to find matches near you. So Tinder collects your geolocation. The question is, is this data? And how can this data be used? Well, the latitude and the longitude would give your location anywhere on Earth. The geolocation information is a form of data and it has pretty significant implications. For example, let's say when you were playing with Tinder, 
someone else was driving around also using Tinder. So first, this person is here on the map. And when this person sees you as a potential match, Tinder gives out how far you are from this person, three miles. And then this person moves to a different location, again, looked at your profile. And at the second location, Tinder says you are two miles from this person. OK, now this person moves a third time, being here. And then, again, looking at your profile, now Tinder tells this user that you're one mile from this person. Now, this is a fairly common algorithm that is used in geolocation research. It's called triangulation. Basically, if I know you are three miles from me here, two miles there, and one mile there, then if I draw three circles at the intersection of the three circles, I will be able to figure out your exact location. So as you can see, not only is geolocation information data, it also has some very important privacy implications. So our next example is a short audio clip. Uh, we put down the text there, Chaco, you, you, you. Well, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate it. So if you just look at the text, it does not sound so harmful. Now let me play this video to give you a context so to see if you can read any tone from the voice. You're the only financial institution that can't produce a balance sheet or a cash flow statement with their earnings. Well, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate it. <laughs> so as you can see, voice with tones, it gives you the context. It's different from the sheer text that we looked at earlier on product reviews. And so the question is, is this data? Well, this is also data. So the context of this audio clip was a financial analyst asking the previous CEO of Enron, Skilling, at a Enron conference call about why Enron couldn't produce a balance sheet or cash flow statement from their numbers. So things are not adding up. And then Skilling was responding to the question. So knowing this background, Hearing this conversation, as we can all appreciate that, what Skilling was actually saying was blip, 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 blip you very much, and we really don't appreciate this question. So as you can see, speech or voice can be very informative. And in reality, there are usually two different ways we can use speech for analysis. One way is to use humans to code the speech, reading the meaning behind the text itself. And the second way, nowadays, there are software that has been packaged to conduct speech analysis that can read the tone below the surface. So all the previous examples represent a form of data. They may not be in the conventional sense data, but the way to think about this is any form of information that you receive every day is a form of data. And it is fair to say that in today's world, data is ubiquitous. There are, generally speaking, in marketing, two forms of data, primary data and secondary data. Primary data is the kind of data that we usually go out to collect. So it's the kind of data that we gather with a goal. For example, if we want to find out the customer satisfaction with our product in the market, then we can go to the market to find out our customers and conduct surveys to figure out customer satisfaction. Secondary data is the kind of data that is out there. So secondary data can be collected by the company itself or by a third party or by a government institute like the Census, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. There are many other sources. So the data is already out there, and we may be able to analyze the data to figure out something meaningful to our business. So for primary data, 
there are generally speaking three different types. There's survey data, as I just mentioned. There's experiment data, where we have a more controlled environment to collect data, and we'll discuss experiments in a later lecture. And the third type, observation data. In a conventional sense, observation data very commonly is to observe how customers are using our product, like PNG watching someone doing laundry, so that they can figure out the laundry process, and that may help them improve their detergent. In a more recent context, observation data could be the eye tracking data, basically observing how people are browsing the internet pages. And for secondary data, there are different ways to categorize it. Here's one way to look at them as structured data versus unstructured data. And the structured data tend to come already in number forms. So here are some examples like store sales, consumer purchase panels, the marketing data like how much we spend on advertising, what kind of media do we spend on advertising, so all the geolocation example we just gave. So these data tend to be structured. So they come in some form of numbers, and the software like Excel can analyze such data relatively easily. A second form of secondary data is unstructured data. So unstructured data often comes in very different forms. When you get a unstructured data, it's usually not numbers. It tend to be in some other format. So in this case, for example, customer reviews, when you get them, they would be in textual form. And uh, it could be pictures. It could be voice or speech. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It could be video. And these unstructured data tend to require fairly sophisticated machine learning techniques to extract information out. The main reason being that if we use human coders to code unstructured data, let's say we code a whole movie on the sentiments expressed in the movie, the amount of work tend to be enormous. So humans can only conduct that kind of coding at a relatively small scale. And that is why in today's world, we tend to use machines to do the work. And in this course, we're not going to touch upon machine learning, but we will take a look at how we may use Excel to do some pre-processing of textual data. Another term that you hear quite often these days is big data. And the big data is a fairly general term. It, it covers all kinds of data that is large in size. Here are some general guidelines about what a big data is. By nature, big data tend to be secondary data. They are often the kind of data that companies collect without a very specific goal to begin with, or they may figure out some use of the data down the road. Uh, they tend to be concurrent, and they will stay forever. So for example, when you are using Snapchat, and uh, Snap as the company will be able to track everything that you've gone through, who you have talked with, and uh, who you've connected, uh, where are you when you were using the app. And then that kind of uh, information for millions of users, the data tends to be very large and grow in explosive quantities. And in addition, big data is often uh, unstructured. So the role of big data in marketing, we can use them to identify opportunities. So for example, geolocation data can be used to deliver location-based advertising or promotions. Uh, when you are near the Galleria, you receive a text message about a promotion. So they can be used to identify marketing opportunities. And we can use that for exploratory research. Uh, usually, they first cut at a problem. So for example, Snapchat may be able to identify a new trend when they find out that a lot of people are sharing a product information at a certain location. And it identifies early success of a marketing campaign. And nowadays, especially in the mobile world, big data can be used uh, to create real-time recommendations. So for example, TikTok would 
continuously feed you new content. And the kind of new content that TikTok delivers to you would be based on your viewing history. And in a context like that, such real-time recommenders tend to be relying on some kind of machine learning algorithm behind the curtain to give you recommended videos. So I hope that short lecture gives you some idea about what we consider as data nowadays. Pretty much everything that contains information is data. So the question again is how do we use such information? And how do we make this data that I have just talked about accessible from a marketing perspective? And here are the steps that we go through to process data. We go through these steps on almost any kinds of data we have. Uh, how important or how laborious each step is really depends on the context of the data and how we plan to make use of it. So the first step is to collect or acquire the data. Uh, collecting data could simply be talking to your manager and you will receive a spreadsheet in email. So in a more complicated scenario, this could involve signing a non-disclosure agreement with a company and get into the company and design an experiment for the company to collect the data that can help answer business questions. Step two, after we get the data, there's usually a cleanup stage. We'll actually look a little bit about how we clean up data in Excel. So after the data is clean, we need to make the data usable. By usable, I mean some of the data in their original form, even if it's clean, we are unable to analyze that directly. An example would be things like voice, speech, pictures, text. And in this course, we'll introduce some general ideas of uh, data coding. After coding, the next step is to look at what's going on in the data. You might have learned this in other courses. They talk about uh, using descriptive statistics, plotting charts. So we will talk more about this step using some Excel examples. This is the step that I consider as extremely important, especially from a marketer's perspective. We are doing marketing and our job tends not to be focusing on the analytics side. So we do not necessarily have to apply very sophisticated modeling, but for what we do, being able to figure out ways to explore the data, to use charts and summaries to figure out what's going on is extremely helpful. And then the final step is modeling and the data analysis which we're going to learn more when we go deeper. So these five general steps are applicable in almost any scenario when we deal with a data set. Next, we're going to look at a few examples. The first one, we're going to look at how to grab data online. And Excel has beefed up its function in this regard significantly. And the step we take is under the banner data, and then on the most left cluster within data, we're going to see different options to get data. And the next example, we're going to look at grabbing data from the web. Thank you. Keep up the good work. And I will show you the Excel examples in separate videos.